Okay, so um, great pleasure to be here again. I'm going to try and be quick and have the same strategy some of you will remember for tomorrow. That is, just make a few comments on the papers and presentation, which were all great and I enjoyed very much, and then have a bit of a rant uh, about something. Um, less of an outrageous rant, I think, today. Um, but maybe just then to start with the, the papers and presentations, which again, I thought illustrate the kind of um, high quality of work people are doing now in, uh, in, in empirical finance and on in implementation issues. Uh, so maybe a common question to uh, Kleist and Shafiq, actually, which is just to get your sense of where, you know, where do you think we're headed on the structure of the corporate tax? And that's partly prompted by Alex this morning. Alex Cobbins said, obviously, we're headed for formula apportionment uh, at the end of the day. And I can see where that's coming from. When we think about kind of analogies with subnational corporate taxes, they all have some element of formula apportionment there. But, you know, more generally, it seems to me, if you ask where are we headed, I think the short term, you could say we're headed for a mess, um, particularly if pillar one, suppose for a moment pillar one happens, you have pillar one on top of pillar two and the minimum tax. I mean, how many people in the world understand how that all, all plays out? Um, it's hugely complex. So you could say it's, it's kind of unsustainable. The good thing you could then say, I'm going to resist the half cup thing, an energy metaphor, like the plague. Um, I'm not going to say anything about cups and water. Um, you could say, well, the good thing is that, again, Alex has pointed, Alex pointed out that really the, um, the, the pillar two, pillar one has thrown out um, the principle of arm's length pricing. In an intellectual sense, the defense of the arm's length pricing is the only way you can do things. That's kind of now gone. That, that, that sort of the genie is out of the bag. But of course, there's another genie out of the bag, which is um, um, the destination element, um, which, is in, which is in pillar one. And you know, you could say that but if it weren't for four or five US senators, we'd be talking here about a destination-based cash flow tax worldwide. So, you know, I think you could, so I'm curious to know where Shafiq and Kleist think we might be beheaded in that long term, whether they, you know, how, how is this all going to ultimate? It seems to be things are kind of up in the air, which is very exciting. All these new principles we're now allowed to talk about. Five years ago, you couldn't go to the OECD, talk about formal apportionment, for, talk about destination-based taxes. Now it's all over the place. So, so where, is, where are the pieces all going to fall? Uh, so that was a kind of, that wasn't a rant. That was a question for Kleist and, and Shafiq. Um, Nadine, I really have very little to say. I think it was a very nicely constructed paper. I was curious why you didn't use the export price data, but I think you kind of explained, explained that. I suppose South Africa always makes me think, what about mining? Is there anything to say about mining in this context? So we know, for example, mining companies might well have zero profits for a very long time. And I don't quite remember how the kind of ring fencing and so on works out in South Africa but I'd be curious to know more about, a uh, little bit more about, uh, about the mining. It's a very small comment. I think Petter is, I think, very convincing that uh, non-linearities we have to take very seriously. Two thoughts on that, I suppose. One is, what does that mean in terms of what a sensible minimum would be? Does it mean, because it's so non-linear, all we need is a very low minimum, because that will cut every, pretty much everything up. Are we done if we have a, you know, a minimum of 5%, 10%? Uh, so in that sense, did it actually weaken the case for an aggressive minimum? It's very non-linear. I, I don't know. But I'd be curious how that plays out in terms of how we think about what the minimum should be. And I guess as a more general point, I mean, we don't really talk much about what the minimum rate should be or how we're going to change it if we want to change it. But that's maybe not for today. So let me, I have a few more minutes, turn to the, the small, not really a rant, and it's kind of been anticipated by Shafiq, maybe not too surprisingly since we come from a common intellectual heritage, so to speak, which is this question, which has also come up a couple of other times in sessions here, which is, well, do we focus too much on profit shifting uh, as, a, as a DRM, as a DRM issue? And by we, I should say, I mean academics, I mean policymakers, and I mean not least donors, people who are supporting uh, work in this kind of area. And, okay, I'm going to overstate the argument just to be clear. So, of course, it's well-established profit shifting in the developing country, context is important. So let's say one, somewhere between one and two percent of GDP, maybe it's important. Clearly it's interesting. It's intellectually challenging. Corporate tax issues are always super interesting. Um, but the correlation between things that are important and interesting isn't always one, right? I mean, there can be things that are important, but actually not very interesting. 
And between ourselves, don't tell us to anybody, but I think carbon taxation kind of fits into that category. It's kind of, as economists, okay, what are you going to say? Have a tax. But anyway, that's a digression. So I think the question becomes, well, you know, given, given the administrative uh, and human constraints in many low-income countries, is counteracting profit shifting, or crudely, is it the best way to go about meeting the kind of revenue needs that we know are huge? Or what is, what is its place within an overall portfolio of measures? And of course, it would be great if we could capture that 1% to 2% of GDP in revenue, but um, we pretty much know we're not going to do that. Um, just as an aside, we off, we're often given numbers for how initiatives, you know, this, this initiative on international tax has raised X million, X million dollars, which is always kind of interesting and impressive. Um, but when you ask, well, what is that in percent of GDP? Um, given this, this, the kind of scale of the problems we face, it's often not so impressive. But um, I think we know, too, that measures are hard. I think Nadine's work I interpret as being, you know, these measures are not a kind of, uh, they don't sort of solve the problem uh, without a lot more effort. Um, I think in, in counter, on contrast, one might say, so, well, there's profit shifting, but there's really coordination. Coordination becomes the issue. So uh, I remember some numbers we did on when the OECD 2015 figures came out on the revenue loss from profit shifting. So globally, a rule of thumb, that was equivalent to like 2.5 points on the corporate tax rate worldwide. And compared to the kind of changes we've seen in the corporate tax rates, that's not, okay, that's, that's kind of where the action is, it seems to be, on the coordination side. Of course, there's also the question that we look elsewhere, and I think Kleist gave a very nice example of that in the EU, looking to, to, to losses on the VAT. The analog in developing countries, the number that I remember we cited a while ago, was to say that if you take... Okay, C efficiency is a kind of measure of the effectiveness of the design and um, implementation of a VAT. But if you look in low-income countries, you take the countries in the lowest quartile of C efficiency, which means a bad kind of VAT, you raise that just to the median, just to the median for low-income countries, that's three and a half points of GDP. And that's kind of, we're kind of pretty sure we know how to, how to do that. And of course, I think the other point is, I think sometimes it takes the focus on profit shifting in the developing country context, takes our eyes off the, the analytical eyes off other kind of issues that are at least as important, like customs. Who talks about customs other than in the kind of profit shifting context? 25% of revenue in many of these countries. What do academics have to say about that? Pretty much nothing. What do we know about the incidence of customs? We, we go all these little studies of incidence in developing countries. We say customs, we don't really know about customs. Let's throw out 25% of revenue. So anyway. This is becoming quite a good rant, actually. I'll keep going. <laughs> but the final aspect, I think, is to say, for no more minutes. Uh, okay, one thirty seconds. No, I'll no, I'll I'll obey my instructions. Thank you very much. That's it. Thank you. So let's just make a quick round and uh, like, so is it answer? So like, the first question was for Clayce and Shafiq. You got like very short time each. So are we headed for? Uh, formal apportionment for a mess or for something else? Well, I cannot guarantee that we are headed for a mess, but uh, but it's a, it's a good guess. Um, no, more seriously, I think it's obvious that if you if you have a system as we the architecture that we've built so far is based on the idea that the taxing right goes to where the value is created, and that puts a lot of strain on the transfer pricing disciplines, because they are the ones that are the only guardrail we then have against the profit uh, shifting. And we have seen, I think convincingly, that there's a limit to how much work the transfer pricing discipline can do in, as, a, as a safeguard. Now, um, of course, if you, if you put in place a minimum tax, you do also relieve some of the strain on this transfer pricing uh, system. We have f several times in the EU put forward proposals for uh, doing a unitary tax uh, system, uh, and we will do it again. Uh, but we have to travel through the unanimity process, so that it's a long and, and, uh, and, winding, uh, and winding road. Now, it's also true that Pillar 1 does open the door for another philosophy, right? It does open the door for the philosophy that you allocate some of the taxing rights 
to where the customers are. And it is obvious that that has an impact on the elasticity of the tax base. Because if you are in a country where you can call up your prime minister and say, if you don't give me a, a, a tax sweetener deal, I'm going to move my factory. It's, that is a credible threat, but it's not a very credible threat to call up your, 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 your prime minister and say, I'm going to move the customers because they are going to bloody uh, stay. So I do think that there is uh, some music in, uh, in, in, in thinking about having this transition. But of course, moving the whole ship is, uh, is enormous. Yeah, okay, no, so, uh, you know, Mick always asks uh, difficult questions. So m my take on this is instead of doing prediction is just to make an observation, and that is we know now Europe is, is getting more keen to tax uh, excess profit, where excess profit or windfall profits are defined differently in different countries, Italy among many others. And I think that just suggests that in some sense the, uh, governments are keen to tax economic rent at the end of the day, and maybe maybe that will be the direction that we'll be moving on, uh, and that will require also coordination. And so let's ask uh, Peter now that the microphone is over here, whether his nice nonlinear results say something about like a reasonable level for the, the global minimum tax. Uh, not really, but you, 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 you make a good case that it could weaken uh, the, the case for very high. But we both know that uh, we have the 15%. We, we have the 15 percent and you know it's not if, if it's going to hold at all it's not going to change any uh, time soon but obviously for uh, countries who have effective tax rates around 30 percent uh, this uh, uh, this floor of 15 percent is, is is a problem and I wonder whether using the models that are standard whether we if, if we Estimated using only a subsample of uh, countries which have high effective tax rates, you know, the, you, you might observe uh, the, because now most of the profits are reported around the zero percent, right? But if, if, if you get rid of that, maybe, you know, it will behave very similarly at the 15 percent. Let's see. And fascinating from Shafiq on the discussion on the pillar two, and that's in case I had more time, that's where I would be uh, going, whether countries should be uh, joining, uh, implementing the reform, whether it pays off, and you know, what about the tax incentives? So looking forward to continuing that. And there are two questions for you, Nadine. So one is whether your nice prices on import prices also hold when you look at export prices, and the other one is if you know something about mining. Um, yeah, so export prices, so we, we abstracted from them for now because uh, we don't see intra and extra firm trade, um, so that is the main, it's just a practical reason. So mining is super interesting. So actually over, um, over lunch, I spoke to, to a representative of the Extractive Industries Transparency, uh, Transparency Initiative, and they apparently have like super detailed data. So I think that would be um, super interesting to look at that. Um, and I also want to support your point about the opportunity cost uh, with, within tax authorities. Um, so I think this is like a super important point. So we pay a lot of attention to implementing very um, complex measures against multinational profit shifting. And you know, especially within less developed countries, um, high skilled labor is very scarce and it can be probably you know, used very effectively elsewhere. And I think we need to pay attention to that. Great. Thank you very much. So the session is, is over, but let's applaud like our four speakers and Mick for his uh, insightful comments and questions. Thank you.